Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Tour for Diversity Road to Residency. This is the radiology um, session. And this year, we have an abundance of riches. We have um, lots of different panelists, all radiologists, all with different backgrounds from different parts of the country that are here to share some of the experiences um, for the applicants to um, benefit from as they navigate the radiology residency application process. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, so we'll start out first just by saying thank you so much to all the panelists. It's a Monday night. <laughs> Some people are still at work and probably still juggling the list. Um, we're extremely, extremely grateful. Uh, the Tour for Diversity, SNMA, LMSA crews, really grateful for your um, contribution to advancing the field of radiology and diversifying the face of medicine. So thank you for the time and being here. It is much appreciated. We will start out just by doing quick introductions. And since I'm the one talking, I'm just going to pick the next person um, so they start and then they can, they can hand off. So um, Dr. Bradshaw, do you wanna introduce yourself? Tell us where you're from. There we go. Hey, Marcus Bradshaw, I'm a professor of radiology at Vanderbilt and the Nashville VA. I'm also the vice chair of diversity affairs there. Originally from Atlanta, Georgia, I've done all my training around the Southeast and I'm just happy to be here. And I'm gonna kick it off to Laura. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Laura Heinemann. I, too, am a professor of radiology. I um, was assistant program director um, at UNC for, what, four years and Duke for six, um, was at Vanderbilt last year, and I am currently in between jobs. So I, um, I, I am currently undecided. Um, there you go. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, answering whatever questions, helping in any way I can. And I <laughs> will pass off to Jade, who's next on my little Hollywood squares here. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, my name is Jade Anderson. Um, I am actually a first year attending as of August 1st uh, at University of Wisconsin. Thank you, thank you. Um, I did my training in med school in Boston at Boston University. I went to Hampton University for undergrad. Um, and then uh, I did a short stint in orthopedic surgery before I switched radiology and then um, musculoskeletal imaging and intervention here uh, for fellowship. So I just stayed on as staff. It's great to meet everyone. Oh, and Juliana. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm Juliana Bueno. Um, um, I'm the program director for the Diagnostic Radiology Program at UVA. I've been here for 12 years. I've been directing the program for the last four years. And before then, I was associate program director for a couple more. Um, more importantly, during the pandemic, which has been a good challenge as a program director. Um, happy to be here. I've been part of the diversity and inclusion initiative for my department for several years as well. We started the program in 2017 and I've been uh, leading it. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to share my experience. Uh, and I can go with Angel Thomas. Hi, thank, thanks for the invitation. My name is Angel Gomez Cintron. I am a musculoskeletal radiologist. That I guess I, I was invited here because I was a, a residency program director for 13, one, three years. So, um, and stepped down uh, two years ago. And I still work in the residency, um, uh, more like interviewing folks and part of the CCC. And, um, and always uh, enjoy being a mentor uh, through all these years. Um, and I'm at the University of Texas in San Antonio. I just moved here from uh, UAB, University of Alabama in Birmingham. Oh, I have to choose somebody. So Payam, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Payam Massaband, uh, also a recovering program director. So uh, just shy of 10 years at uh, a program director at Stanford. Um, and uh, now vice chair of education and uh, clinical affairs. 
um, and uh, 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 cardiovascular imager by, by trade. Uh, and uh, we'll pass it on uh, to Cameron. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cam Henry. I am a cardiovascular fellow at Vanderbilt. Um, it's been a long time. I recognize a lot of the faces here. Uh, and I'm just glad to be here. Uh, hope you pass on knowledge. Who is up next? Uh, that was it. I was the last one. Oh, I think it might be me, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I forgot. I'm Toma Mafoye. I am a breast radiologist. I can't believe I'm the only one because breast is best. Um, I am breast at the best. University I'm of Texas. Breast, breast is best. It's alliterative and it rhymes. Like it, we're winning. Um, <laughs> I'm at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, uh, and serve as the strategic director of education. Um, and I'm just really excited to have you all here. We have created this entire forum for you. So don't be shy. Please put any questions you may have in the chat. Um, since we do have a lot of panelists, what we'll do is try to limit, you know, maybe two to three panelists to answer each question. Um, but you may have some of the panelists actually just continue to respond via the chat if, you know, they could think of something else that really hasn't been mentioned up until that point. How does that plan sound? Okay, awesome. So um, can I, can I, I need some help. Um, Jay, do you mind helping me just monitor the chat in case I, I miss it? Yes, please. Thank you so much. So I actually am really excited this year that we have a fellow and a new attending because folks who have been through that process recently also provide a perspective that's maybe closer than what we can provide as faculty. Um, so this is your opportunity to kind of be open with them. So I'm gonna start out by asking the question that I get most frequently, which is how can radiology applicants use their signals and geographic preferences um, to their best advantage? So I'm just gonna repeat what I heard at APDR last week. Um, for the most- What's part APDR? Association for Program Directors. They had a Zoom meeting last week to talk about the up upcoming application system. Um, and they noted that the most important thing was your signals. And so um, signals trumped everything. It trumped regionals. Um, programs were really using signals to determine who was interested in their program because we just get inundated with applications. And so in terms of your signals, I think it's important to note that we don't know how many signals you give. Cause I've heard some students say, well, I'm only gonna give three or four signals and then they'll take those very seriously. That's not the case. We only know that you give out a signal. So use all 12 is the first thing I would say. And then you should really use your signals at places that you are really interested in going to. I've seen a lot of people trying to play games with their signals and maybe if I send it here, um, don't pitch and toe yourself into a particular program because you're trying to play a game. So apply to programs that you're really interested in, use the signals at those programs. Um, yes, you should be realistic with your application in terms of how strong it is. And so talk to your mentors, talk to your advisors and figure out you know, where people in your, with your, at your school who have your typical application where they are strong applicants at, but you should really use our signals and apply to places that you're interested in. Oh, if I could tag on to that, um, as it relates to signals, looking at your personal statements, I've seen this a few times when I've been helping people with their statements over the last few years. You don't want to pigeonhole yourself in your personal statement by saying, I want to end up in California or at this school and sending that out to everyone. It might sound crazy, but I've seen that. And if I were reading a personal statement to have someone apply to my institution, and it specifically names two other institutions and they're gushing over it, it might come off weird. Um, I don't know if anyone has any more to say on that matter, um, but yeah, try to keep your statements uh, without necessarily naming a particular school 
or state you're really interested in, unless that's the only place you're applying. Yeah, I, can I add something? I th um, Please, thanks. Yeah. So I, I think the signals, it's important to remember that they are meant to increase your chances to get an interview. They're not supposed to impact the anything else along the process except for the interview chances. So in that case, I would think that Yes, participate in the supplemental application. Use your signals in a way that you choose your region and you choose your best programs, but know that they are be taken into account for that um, interview process more than a selection process after you interview. Um, for example, at UVA, we had 1,200 applications last year, as in many big programs, and and getting the pool of signals just told me as a program director that those are the students that are seriously interested in the program, so you naturally give preference to at least the review of those applications. It doesn't mean that we're inviting only people who signal us, because we invited at the end people who, you know, gave geographic preferences and different criteria, mm -hmm. um, but it definitely facilitates the way that you're reviewing those applications uh, mm -hmm. through the of, of, of applicants that you get. Absolutely. Thank you, um, everyone, for that. And yes, Cam, last, Cameron Henry, last year we had an applicant who had sent, you know, their letter of, um, their personal statement had a specific school named as like their favorite school, and that was not us. And that, I actually felt bad for them because I was scared they had sent it to everyone on the application um, trail, and it, that may be the case. So yeah, you have to be very careful. Um, that kind of takes us to our next question. You know, since the pandemic and virtual interviews, it seems like there are a lot of, of applications that go to each program. Um, how does an applicant stand out? Is it just the signals? Is, is there anything else that you can do to make your application stand out, especially somebody who's underrepresented in medicine? And I know NHL has a video about this somewhere, so don't make me pick on you. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I mean, I, I did when I, I, you know, I started at the end of my residency program, whatever I was, it was through the pandemic. So I lived through the the, the chaos of, of going everything through Zoom. But I mean, the, the panorama is obviously changing because um, we're, we have less subjective data. And, and so that is supposed to be uh, creating a more holistic way to evaluate the applications. But um, if you if you think about it, um, you, you're you know you're taking a lot of conscious bias out, and then you're introducing a lot of unconscious bias. So th those things you can't control. Uh, but it, you know every program is different. That's what's make it very challenging. I think what's important to let's say here UT Hale San Antonio may be different from over there at, at, U, at UVA and exactly what you look for in the application when you don't have grades. It, it may vary from place to place. So uh, the best thing you can do is create a story for yourself and, and kind of um, everybody kind of does the same things in, in all honesty, but you can, the way you, you put, the way you portray your story can be unique. And I mean, I've read thousands and thousands of personal statements and all that. And I think that there's some people who are better at captivating you and your attention. Um, it, but how to get noticed is about increasing your visibility. I mean, when, uh, you know, we at, at, at UAB in Texas received the same 12, 1200 applications and um and of course there were filters in the past of step one there are still some filters that you do but in the efforts to do any more holistic you know most brand directors will create a list of the things that are important to them and give them a number and try to see what what about you know community service whatever it is that the program uh, finds important so uh, but in terms of visibility is to getting out there and you know i think i i used to tell you know medical students if i click your application you're winning Right, so because I mean, you've got to have hundred applications. I'm um, just, and that's what signaling does. You just makes me click the application, and once I click and I open, I read it. You have a win because I open it. I may not give you an interview, but I open it. And the way to do that is to increase your visibility, which you can do in many ways. You know, you can go do an away rotation. You can get involved in national meeting societies and go to national meetings network. You can get into social media and try to do the best you can. Um, I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm in, I'm, I'm in social media, but I've, I've gone through applications and say, oh, I recognize that name. I don't know where it was from. And I click it and I open it and that's a wait for you. So um, in, 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 in summary, make your own story, 
be compelling everybody does about the same things but try to make it uniquely yours and in terms of visibility go out there and get seen and you should want somebody to click your name and it may be that they recognize your name from a project you did with rsna or the acr or because you rotated with them or because they saw your name in twitter sharing something important whatever it is i mean the rules are very broad you just use it to your advantage i'm gonna add a slightly different perspective that's awesome um I mean, I think Please every ahead, program yeah. does things, you know, totally differently. Um, I will tell you, and, you know, it, granted, it has been more than a year since I have been involved in, in reading applications. But um, at the time at Duke, when we got, you know, a gazillion applications, all the applicants, so there was an, an initial um, very baseline sort of screening level below or above which every application was read. So everybody got clicked on. Um, we had several people reading applications in kind of a standardized way um, to essentially score that application um, to then filter things down so that the APD and the program director specifically, you know, would look at those. Um, so every application was read um, and ways to stand out, I would say, um, I, I think the letters of recommendation come into play a lot. Um, they, they do have weight. Um, I think people who clearly know you as an individual and can speak to your strengths personally um, can have an impact. Um, I think the personal statement is important in terms of telling that narrative um, and particularly, you know, what your perspective is, what your strengths are, what you're looking for in a program um, all come into play in, in terms of sort of getting um, somebody to highlight that application to to then you know say let's let's take a second look and and dive in a little bit. Um, somebody mentioned social media. I think at some programs it's important, and other programs it's not important at all. Doesn't come into play at all. Um, so you know, again, every every place is very different. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much. And I wanted to let the applicants know this it, it, because it was mentioned in passing and I'm not sure if applicants are aware. We've gone throughout most of radiology to a holistic um, evaluation of applications, which means that most programs, and I see people are nodding, so I guess people agree. Most programs are really trying to shy away from just saying, um, what is your step two score? What's your GPA, right? Like what do your, your medical school grades look like? Um, and using that as a, the only selection criteria to invite you to an interview. Um, I think what Angel was pointing out is that what that also means though, is that if we're not looking at the step two score, if we're not looking at um, grades, what we're looking at becomes very, very variable. And then how much do you look at one thing versus another thing is opportunity for bias to be introduced. So just to give you that perspective, but I think it actually can have a lot of advantages as you're an, as an applicant right? Because you have multiple different spheres um, which which to distinguish yourself. You're not just tied down to just what did your step two grade look like or what did your you know, medical school transcript look like? And in fact, a lot of schools are not even um, doing the high pass honors, pass fail grades like they used to. Um, so a lot of other things, I'll say hobbies even, um, can become ways to, to stand out and generate interest in your application. Um, so you have multiple ways to distinguish yourself and I, I would take that um, seriously. Okay, um, hi, we have, we have another panelist. Uh, Dr. Imani, do you wanna say hello? Just introduce yourself and where you're from. Hi, thanks, yeah, sorry I'm, I'm late. I, I got the time zones uh, uh, switched up, but my name is Rezi Imani. I'm the uh, um, program director for the Interventional Radiology Program here at Vanderbilt. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, was there a question? In the oh, there's a question. Yes, it says, um, 
are there any positives or negatives to posting your applicant introduction um, on Twitter slash X? Um, and I think as Dr. Bradshaw mentioned, and I think um, what Dr. Gomez was mentioning too is sometimes you're just going for name recognition, <laughs> brand recognition. So that's okay if you have a good brand, if you know how to be, you know, someone who appeals to the masses, then you probably can make some good impressions off of Twitter for the programs that are on Twitter um, and the program directors who are. But I will say a lot of radiologists is active on, on, on Twitter. Um, so if you are on there, know that everything that you post online um, can be made public, even if you think it's a private account or whatever. Um, people may just accidentally come, against, come across something and um, factor that in, good or bad. Um, okay, so Can question here. If that one? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I do want to add on to the idea of social media kind of helping your app. As you're applying or even as you just go throughout residency, Twitter and radiology Twitter is a great place to find research opportunities and to meet mentors. I kid you not, I literally pointed at someone going up the stairs at AUR. It's like, I remember you from Twitter. And that guy has become a great mentor in chess for me <laughs> outside my institution. So you'd be surprised how many of us are on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now <laughs> and how you can use it to your advantage. Absolutely. That's the cheat sheet he just gave you there. Um, so next question. Um, if this says board scores are an issue, how should an applicant deal with that? So um, anyone can chime in? Yeah, I can, uh, I'm happy to pick up on that one. Um, so, I mean, less of a, I guess, less of an issue now with the past fail with step one, there's still going to be some obviously folks with step one, but, um, you know, doing away at that place, um, at that, you know, institution that you're interested in. Because uh, that month long rotation is an interview. Um, get involved in a society. If it's IR, then SIR. If it's uh, DR, then RSNA. Um, do research, uh, get good letters. I've even seen some people um, take a year off in between and do research, dedicated research. Um, so they just, you know, if you just make it difficult for the, uh, you know, the committee to say, you know, to pass on you because of the score, I've seen many people where, you know, the step, one score is low, but they've clearly, you know, picked it up in the other ways. And you're like, yeah, but, you know, they went to this conference and won this award or they, you know, um, they've done research with this notable person, took a year off and uh, they're clearly interested. They did an away rotation here and they rocked it. Um, so, you know, those are all ways you can stand out. May I add on a follow-up question to that, actually? Um, so I've actually been getting questions from my mentors. Actually, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm so, so sorry. One second. I'm so sorry, Jay. Can we, because I think Payam was going to respond to that question, and then we'll go to sure. your follow-up question so we continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Sorry. Well, I, actually, one thing I was going to say, not specifically about the board scores, but one of the questions I get asked frequently is, you know, what's a red flag? Uh, and, and, you know, I've come to... Uh, have a sort of a different understanding of this over the years. And to me, the the red flags are the things uh, that that may stand out in your application in say a negative way, but then you don't address it in say a personal statement. Uh, so this idea that that it won't be seen uh, or you try to say not comment on it because it's something say that you you are ashamed of, I would I would say, uh, it's. I would look at it exactly the opposite, and say it's an opportunity. You know, any any of us can talk to you, talk your head off about our failures. We've all had challenges, and the question is how we deal with them. And the best way is to deal with them, and is to comment on them, and to explain. Uh, you know, not in a defensive way uh, necessarily. And there's many different ways that maybe you don't feel your application. Um, uh, uh, is 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 perfect, um, but but what I would say is sort of showing how you've grown through that, um, and and using it as an opportunity to demonstrate your ability to take ownership and learn from mistakes. Uh, and to me, uh, that that uh, you know something that you decide not to comment on is what ends up becoming uh, the red flag. 
not that you failed, we've all failed. And I think that that demonstrating ownership and uh, that you're somebody who can learn uh, from those challenges, I think is very refreshing. So keep that in mind. Sorry, Jade. No, I agree with everything that both of you actually just said, um, but I do get from my mentors uh, the question as to whether because step one is now pass fail, let's say they didn't do so hot on step two, would taking step three before those applications and being able to have that score back, um, does that help uh, boost the applicant's application? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I personally don't think so. Uh, you know, once the scores are the scores, I think that the way we move to review applications towards a holistic way and really just as we're saying, seeing the whole person, uh, it doesn't really matter. A lot of people enter residency without step three. Um, so yeah, I don't think it, um, it's, it's something that's factored in. I completely agree with you, Payan. Uh, you know, resilience and, and, and learning how to uh, overcome those challenges and showing uh, ownership is the most important thing. I have a similar question for our PDs and former PDs. Um, now that step one is pass fail, I've seen some students debating whether or not they should take step two. So if you have someone who's passed step one and they don't take step two, how do you view that? Do you view it as if they're trying to duck the test or, or what? Because that is definitely a question that has come up several times this year. I feel hey, like I am saying you better. I, it's hard to fault that. <laughs> you better explain that in a personal statement, I guess. <laughs> no, I'm sure. Well, I mean, different. the other question we get is how do we compare in the in these, uh, you know, some folks are taking gap years. You have some applicants who have step one scores and some who are pass fail. And like Dr. Bradshaw was saying, you have some who've maybe taken step two and some who haven't. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's straightforward and, and, and anyone who says, well, you know, we're able to compare without consideration. I think there's a lot unconscious maybe going on. Um, and, and so I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I would say that is likely as we face more and more applications that more and more programs will be using step two as a mechanism and that that you know it's unfortunate, but that we've essentially shifted uh, the the that uh, mm -hmm. objective number that we used to use with step one is now on step two. So so I do feel like that does lead to a little bit of pressure uh, for folks to take take step two. Uh, but I think that um, in these transitions, there's there's a, there's a lot of questions that that you know I think we don't have great answers to, in part because what was said earlier is that there's not one program. There's so many of us. And this, the, the, the thought process, the philosophy is so different. I don't think there's any one strategy that would work across mm -hmm. the board. Right. So I don't think that last year I interviewed a single applicant without a step, step two score. Um, I didn't, you know, in all fairness, we kind of split up the, the task between who reviewed all the applications and then who did the interviews because the interviews were blinded to parts of the application. So I didn't have a whole packet on the people I interviewed, uh, but all of those folks had a step two score. The truth of it is, I think as a program director, which I'm not, but as a program director, you wanna know what you're getting in the applicant. And a blank step two score almost makes me more worried about um, whether or not that applicant would need to go take time off to go take step two, did they worry about passing? Now it's not just, oh, you pass and your score was borderline, it's would they, would they even pass at all, right? You, they almost don't know what they are getting in that applicant. So I'd be really cautious about, you know, delaying step two altogether. Um, next, I'll ask this. So how do you go about requesting letters of reference? I Maybe think we should start oh, with that. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, and second, I believe it's what Laura said earlier, but 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 basically, this the, there is this idea that you're going to want to. You, there's a temptation, I think, to get somebody who might be the most famous person in your med school uh, who doesn't know you that well. And I would say, uh, you know, it's already 
you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's already a, a challenge or a spin of the roulette wheel because some write letters better than others. But I think somebody who doesn't know you and you sort of think it would be a good idea just because they have in your mind a, a name that may be well known, I think that won't reflect well on you. Whereas if you were to get a letter from someone who knows you well and can speak to who you are uh, and, and somebody who can speak uh, and, and augment the story that uh, uh, Angel was mentioning earlier, everybody loves a good story. And your, your uh, personal statement starts to paint this picture, starts to tell the story. The more you have these uh, uh, letters of recommendation that would augment that story, that's cemented from people who know you, uh, is, is much more favorable uh, than somebody who, say, maybe worked with you for a week, but happens to be a big name. And I'm, I'm just going to piggyback on that. Um, I don't think it matters how senior the person is. Not only does it not matter if the person's famous, it doesn't matter if, you know, if Jade, as a first year attending, writes a fabulous letter, that goes a really long way. And um, so I don't think it matters where they are in the hierarchy of um, of the academic ladder. Um and, and if you can, give them your personal statement before they write the letter, potentially, or at least sit down and talk to them and sort of, you know, let them know what the narrative is that you're going to be um, telling, I think is, is potentially really helpful, particularly when, you know, ideally you're asked, you're talking to somebody who knows you personally, so... Absolutely. I agree. Um, you know, when I'm reading, I've read lots of letters and, you know, in the beginning, if they say, oh, I knew this person for two weeks or I know this person for, you know, two or three years, it's completely different. And, you know, yeah, big name's great. But like you said, I, it doesn't doesn't matter. Um, it's more the specialty, because then if I'm reading, if you're applying to IR and I see a letter from an interventional radiologist and they tell me that, um, you know, they think that you're going to be a good interventionalist and mm -hmm. you go to patients, I'm like, okay, like, this person knows uh, what we're looking for, and I, I trust them. Um, so can I tag on to that? Can, Jake, yeah, can Jake, because you've probably been through this recently. Well, so um, I was a part of the review committee, and I know every program is different, but it honestly disheartened me because I did see a few people, um, you know, who was applying DEI-wise that did not have any radiology letters whatsoever, and it was just like, we would love to invite you, but you didn't have at least one radiologist suggest that you would be a great radiologist in your letter of recommendation. And so I wanted to open that um, on the floor. And how important is it that you have either majority radiology letters or at least one radiology letter in that application? I Okay, this is where my uh, you know, my thing, I, I get a little bit heated about it. So y'all bear with me. I know exactly what you're talking about. And when that happens, what I do is I look up the school and see if they actually have an academic radiology department, because there are a lot of, of um, URMs who are coming from schools that don't have radiology at all. And yes, I mean, sure, the student could, I don't know, start Googling radiologists in, you know, Houston, Texas or something and, and trying to just cold call people, I mean, potentially, but that's an additional barrier for that student versus the student who had an elect, you know, radiology um, elective from the time they were a first year. So um, for me personally, I don't consider it a red flag, but I'm glad you brought it up because it is something that a lot of people do um, consider to be a, a problem with an application. Yes, please go ahead, Lou. Um, I completely agree. I think, uh, you know, it's not infrequent for students and for all of us to find radiology late in the in the years of medical school and in the fourth year. And sometimes it's by the time that they do their elective rotations that they just happen to choose that elective rotation and they realize that they want to apply, which is, you know, not wrong. It's, it's going to be harder to demonstrate that you've had an interest for a while, but uh, but it's not an infrequent um uh, scenario. Um, and I completely agree. The This process is something that should be genuine from both sides. And I always see the match as a perfect match when a student matches the program that reflects their values. So I do think that if you um, 
as a student come, come to a place where you have researched the programs, you realize what they are, what kind of people they want to train, what they stand for, those are the programs that you want to apply if they align with what you believe in, um, as opposed to trying to go for the ranking, which is so arbitrary. Not not all of them, you know, make the top 10 in proximity and it doesn't really matter. Um, but it really is, is this program matching what I want for my life and for the next five, six years of my life, more important than anything. I'm going to say something probably a little different. Um, I'll say if you don't have. Oh, I'm so sorry. One second. I thought Payam was going to speak on oh, that. Oh, go ahead. Were you um, or no? No, okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah, that's, go sorry ahead. That. Sorry, I was going to say, um, if if I don't see a letter from not, from an IR and you're applying to IR, I think that's kind of a red flag. Um, we've had a lot of attrition in IR um, around, you talk to the program directors, probably around, I don't know, 25 to 30%. Uh, attrition. We have a lot of residents who kind of midway through were like, man, you know what? I really didn't know what I was getting into. Um, so, you know, I get, I came from a program where I went to med school at Howard. We didn't have um, robust IR, but, um, I, you know, that's why that we have our societies, you know, SIR, RSNA, uh, where you get involved nationally. There's opportunities. Um, it's not easy, but, um, you know, people do it. And I think, you know, that just shows me that like you've thought about another level, you've interacted with those folks, you know, um, you're really considering it and things get hard, you're gonna stick with it. So that that to me is really important. It does I really uh, appreciate the candor here. This is why we do these sessions. So thank you, Jade, for raising that question. And thank you everyone who chimed in on that. This is this is what this is about. Sorry, I, time, I think I interrupted you. No, no, Tom, I, I I agree that it it has the capacity to exacerbate inequity. Uh, and given that uh, in radiology, we're starting, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot to make up in that way. Uh, I think that we have to be thoughtful about it. Um, and, and as somebody who switched to radiology after doing three years of surgery, uh, you know, in a sense, I didn't have any radiology uh, letters. Um, but, uh, but, but the point being uh, that uh, if you don't and you found it late, then that is something that we would expect that you would just sort of address in your personal statement. Uh, or if there's a gap of uh, faculty within your uh, uh, med school, uh, then, then that is something you address uh, and potentially demonstrate the efforts that you've made uh, to make those connections uh, as Dr. Imani was alluding to. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's all about uh, uh, telling, telling that story and demonstrating your hunger uh, and demonstrating how uh, you're willing to step up uh, above and beyond uh, to, to get trained. Love that. Love that. Please go ahead and help. Well, I'm just, I guess we can see what I said from the beginning, you know, every single program is different, have different expectations of what they want. But, you know, I think, I guess my, after all these years of being a program director, I think not only like I changed through my 13 years on the things that I thought it was important because I, you know, I trained so many people. I trained people who came from urology and, and ended up being the best residents that I, that I had. I trained people who had the best letters, grades, and, and that are having a very difficult time. All, obviously, all this is anecdotal, but the point is that I, I would, it's just a recommendation, shy away from extreme, you know, kind of um, exclusion, you know, criteria, because I think as I see it is that you, you I mean, the purpose, you want to include people that actually want to do a good job, but you have to be careful not to exclude people that could have done a good job, but it was just a matter of a, of a criteria. Obviously, it's very difficult. We all want to get residents that don't quit and, and do well, you know, and pass the boards and do have ownership. But um, I think it's also very important to to keep that in mind. And, and as I changed in 13 years, I changed at the end. I was like, pro, you know, I was one of those people, like, if you don't have a, a, a recommendation letter from radiologists, you, you didn't do your due diligence. But at the end, after my 13 years, I realized like, you know, some people, yeah, like, like Tomo was saying, they go to schools, the old schools that they don't have any radiology department. They have very difficult times. Sometimes they don't even have money to rotate and, and then maybe the situations are not optimal for them. But, but I agree with you. I, I, I tell all my mentees, get at least one radiology <laughs> recommendation letter because obviously it looks, it looks better. 
So are there any advantages or disadvantages to applying IR and DR? This too is program dependent. You know, I know of programs <laughs> that really, really, um, uh, if there was a, a, a sense that somebody had applied or dual applied, viewed that uh, negatively. Uh, you know, I, I personally, you know, some, you know, uh, we have fabulous residents uh, who do IR and we have them for three years in DR and we love them. And yes, some of them defect to DR, which we love as well. Um, but then there's always somebody who was willing to step up to replace them. Uh, so, so in a lot of ways, it, it works out well. Uh, so, so I would say maybe do some homework about specific programs so you know what their approach is. Um, um, but, but I would say for us, it was very important uh, to try to recruit the best people and try to convince you to do IR or DR um, not to say, um, punish you for doing the one that I didn't choose. Just don't lie. Don't say, I really want right. to do IR. When, I mean, DR when you really want to do IR. I mean, I think it's fair game to apply to both. Just don't lie. Because if you get caught, you know, like there you really want an IR, you're trying to do DR as your safety thing. That's really going to be a big red flag. Just, just be honest. And, and I agree with you. I mean, in, in the, when I was brand director, since the IR started, we have had more residents switching from IR to DR that actually DR to IR, so. Right. Um, you know, my opinion, it, it doesn't matter. Again, it really depends on what you really want. I think it's, uh, we will notice in DR from the trajectory from the projects that that person is inclined to IR. We've been trying to change this perception that people apply to both, but their fallback plan is DR. It's not a fallback plan, it's a different residence, it's a different pathway to the same goal. So we give them both the same importance. We used to have interviews, uh, we used to select the applicants and interview both of the, both programs would interview the same day, the same applicants. Now we just decided to do completely different interviews and they interview with different faculty members. IR the program director is two different days, but they see the advantages of belonging to each of the programs. So I, I would really try to, uh, it's, it's not a fallback plan. It's not like you weren't good enough for IR and you fell on the R. It's just a completely different pathway. And, and I think that it's important to own it because we're gonna be able to help you to get into ESIR and get to your goal. If that's if that's the end goal, absolutely awesome. agree. I, I expect all my. Oh, um, I mean, okay. Um, how do how should applicants select residency programs? And what are some of the mistakes that applicants make in um, kind of evaluating residency programs? What kind of criteria should you use? What criteria do you often use, but probably shouldn't? Uh, use proximity to family or, the, you know, things that are like more important outside of work. Uh, you know, I like I said, I applied surgery and I used to have people say, well, you're going to be in the, this was pre-work hours limits. You're going to be in the hospital 110 hours a week. It doesn't matter what city you live in. And I, I and to me, that was the craziest thing. Nothing could be further from the truth. That almost made it more important what city you lived in. So I feel like the, the thing that people don't think about enough is this is at a time in your life where you're going to have stress. And so having that network and that, that social structure, I think is, I wouldn't dismiss it. Now it's, you know, it's not a requirement, but so I think that's one thing that people don't think about enough. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I'm blessed to be in a name recognition program, but I feel like the people who apply only uh, based on these sort of external rankings make a big mistake uh, and you will be trained very well uh, from almost any program in this country. And the reality is some of those big name ones may not fit you well, and you, it won't be perfect training, even though it's a big name. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I jumped in there. I also feel very passionate about this one. I love that. I feel very passionate about that as well. Um, training seems long. It's what, four or five years, if you want to add your intern year. 
but it will go by in like a few minutes. I say this to say like, I think I sat in front of Pi I'm like six years ago interviewing Stanford. <laughs> and we actually had this conversation. I'm not sure if he remembers when I was uh, rotating. And I chose to go somewhere where I knew I had some family close by. My brother used to live in around Nashville. And I had mentors here that I knew could support me. Um, and not saying I couldn't find it at Stanford, but it's all a personal decision where you go. You, it's a stressful time in your lives. You'll find people will lose grandmothers, parents to find out they have random illnesses. You want people that are going to be able to support you through those things. And sometimes going off to the faraway program where you don't have anyone, it can be hard. That also being said, mm -hmm. um, it's a very short time in your life. Go where you think you will get the best training it is not always the biggest name. I always suggest to my mentees look at, hey, when you're applying places, look at where their trainees go afterward. Are they going to the specialties you want to go into? Are they going to the mm -hmm. practices you want to practice at? If you're interested in, I don't know, practicing in the American Southwest and the place you go for residency sends no one there, no one seems to match there for fellowships, you might want to ask yourself, am I going to end up in the place I want to after training if mm -hmm. I go there? Uh, the same thing goes for like, uh, research during residency. I did this when I was applying, uh, just looking up, okay, do these places publish and do they publish with their residents um, or with their fellows at least? Because um, that's very important if you're looking to go into academics. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. We had Juliana and then Laura. Thank you. I, I don't want to repeat the same thing, but um, I would stick to be genuine. Look, it's a, it's a process of introspection. What's important to you? Look for that. Uh, what's important for us is different. And, 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 and we have, that's why it's called a match. I really think that you're matching to a place that's going to be able to, where you're going to find those tools that are going to fulfill your life. And that's not only training, uh, but it's different for all of us. So I think just that capacity to know what's important and then choose accordingly. Yeah, that's, that's, I would just want to reiterate that. I think it's incredibly important to remember that, and I think Juliana had said this before, this is, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way interview. I mean, you, you are interviewing with the program because you want to put your best face forward. But on the other hand, you want to go somewhere where you can be yourself. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, so questions that I would ask, I mean, I would think about what's important to you. Um, it's hard for me to you know, tell you, everybody, what questions to ask. I think it's important to think about what's important to you and then ask about that. You know, if, if being able to speak up and have, you know, to give feedback as well as receive feedback um, is important to you, then ask residents, um, you know, in what way is that uh, option at your program. Give me, can you give me some examples about, you know, where changes were made based on resonant mm -hmm. feedback? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if family is important to you, then, you know, there are some people for whom family is not either immediately available or it's, it's you know, a very complicated dynamic, then that's not necessarily something to, to focus on. It's, it's very individualistic, but I do think it's very important not to just essentially try to you know, sort of have a promotional interview where you're selling yourself, but really try to get some information both during the interview as well as after the interview. Like go back and try and talk to some people who maybe you mm -hmm. didn't get a chance to talk to during interview day or go back and talk to some of those same, particularly the residents again, yeah. um, just to, to, to yeah. get more of a sense as to where you will be able to um, be yourself as much as possible. Awesome. So we only have a few more minutes. Um, I'll say 
what are some green flags and red flags that you've seen in interviews? And so I want each of our panelists to go around and give us a green flag or red flag that you have experienced in a virtual interview, or maybe you've perpetrated, maybe you're the one. Um, <laughs> I can can start. we start with Bradshaw? Oh, oh Jay. Jay. Yes, Jay, oh, please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, as somebody who does interview, I think um, being careful with where you sit and how the lighting is, um, not having dogs or pets at your feet, or sometimes it's hard to avoid children in the household, so that doesn't bother me as much, but there's certain things that you can control um, is very important um, because we usually have a short amount of time to get through our interview, and so it's really nice when it's uninterrupted and we can kind of focus on you know, what we're discussing. Um, and I think uh, the second thing that I would talk about is we can definitely tell when you're looking at your phone or watch <laughs> during a 